Austin Jorgensen, owner of what was formerly called Dingling and is now called Love Brad Games, had blessed us with one of the most disturbingly brutal indie RPGs ever made. About a year later, we got Lisa the Joyful, an expansion that fleshed out the story and gave the series a very concrete conclusion. And another year later, we're seeing yet another entering the Lisa series, but this time not developed by Austin, but rather the fans. Fan-made sequels to RPG Maker games are quite common these days. Games like Off and Space Funeral have sparked communities actually big enough to have people build entire games based on them. I mean, not to mention the hundreds of Yume Nikki fan games. However, Off, Space Funeral, and Yume Nikki are all freeware, which is why I found it unusual when I heard about Lisa the Pointless RPG, a fan-made spin-off of the Lisa series, which is a commercial product. Then again, there's no shortage of, say, Sonic fan games, another commercial series, and many of those have proven to actually be worth one's time. When you're making a free version of something you normally have to pay for, I don't know, it's just weird when it's an indie game, you know, but either way, I think you guys all know how much I love Lisa, and it's practically my sworn duty to cover anything Lisa related, so let's check it out. Lisa the Pointless, created by a Lithuanian named Edvinas Kondrotas. It launched just recently, December 27th of 2016. I gotta say, it's got a very interesting title screen. The noose is still there, but Lisa is nowhere in sight. Like Lisa the Painful, Lisa the Pointless kicks off with a flashback. Alex, a young boy, is visited by his aunt, who brings him a martial arts training tape. As the years go by, we see him training and becoming a martial artist, much like Brad was. We even see him with what appears to be a hook which is again very interesting, depicting him enjoying the forbidden fruits that no longer exist in the post-apocalyptic world of Lisa. Flash forward and he is now a garbage man. Flash even further forward and he's now the garbage itself. Our adventure begins on Garbage Island, you might remember it as one of the optional locations from Lisa the Painful. We're woken up by a man named Joel who, to his excitement, finds a live bullet in the trash beside us. You know, in this world you might have a gun, but bullets are gonna be very hard to come by. And now that he's got one, he can just take a man's life point and click. And that's a big deal. Alex is nicknamed Lucky by Joel, a name of good fortune, as Alex being dumped on the island also brought the rarity that was the bullet. Seeing Alex as a sort of lucky charm, he decides to go along with him. I mean, hell, it beats living on Garbage Island. It's so gross here. Everywhere you step, it's just garbage. It's so gross, in fact, that at times Alex will randomly vomit and lose health. This game's story is very unlikely, so the painfuls. I mean, instead of a man starting with hope and becoming trash throughout the game, you start out as trash and discover hope throughout the game. It's a story very much like Mad Max Fury Road, a simple tale about a man seeking a better place, a promised land of sorts. Along the way, a lot of people are going to tell you that it doesn't exist, but whether it does or not, there's got to be somewhere better than the post-apocalyptic Olathe. When you're living in the worst possible scenario, you'll take any glimmer of hope you can get. Now, whether or not it's pointless to chase that glimmer, of hope that's what this game's story is all about. The gameplay is identical to Lisa the Painful. It's a side-scroller. You'll explore by hopping up and down ledges, entering caves, and, of course, you'll find yourself fighting jerk-offs and perverts. Now, the combat is where things get interesting. Uh, like Brad, Alex will fight by using combos that you'll input using the WASD keys, but Joel won't fight at all. I mean, he's got a gun, but you gotta remember that he's only got the one bullet, and if he uses it, well, that's it. Instead, his entire move set only consists of buffers and debuffers involving using the gun and the bullet. You might do a gun trick to piss the enemy off, or put the bullet in the gun, or aim the gun at the enemy. I love this idea so much. It's like, he's got the one bullet and he can't use it, but it's like, hey, hey, oh, 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 hey, 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 uh-uh, no, no, oh, 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 that's his move set. Like, he, he can't use the bullet, but he's gonna make you think that he might. The only way Joel can actually deal damage is if he throws an empty bottle at somebody, which may as well be a damn grenade. I mean, like, holy shit, that thing hurts. They're only that effective if they're thrown by Joel, though. Supposedly, he's got the stronger throwing arm. You won't be doing it often, though, because these things are a damn commodity. You're not given very many of them at all, so deciding which battles to use them in can be a pretty tough decision. Well, in fact, the game's really scarce with all the items. I mean, you're really not given very much at all.
all here, and that wouldn't be that much of a big deal if it weren't for the fact that there's no resting areas. Nowhere in the game, except for maybe like one or two story scenes, is there a place to rest. The only way to recover your health is by using healing items, and since you're not given very many of those, you're gonna have to choose your battles very wisely unless you want to see that game over screen. And that wouldn't be that much of a big deal if it weren't for the save points. You can't save the game whenever you want like you could in Lisa of the Painful. Instead, there's these weird checkpoints. Entering certain areas will save your game, but then the crow flies off, never to be seen again. So, since I had to be so careful not to die, my strategies ended up getting boiled down to only using the moves that impede enemies from attacking. This meant only using Alex's attack that has a chance of stunning the enemy, and only using Joel's debuff that has a chance of scaring the enemy. I mean, I understand this game's going for a very pain mode vibe, but honestly, that made this game very frustrating. I found myself doing many of the battles over and over again because I just couldn't save before it, and when I died, I lost more progress than I should have. Dying doesn't mean doing a battle over, it means doing three or four battles over, and that's a big deal. There's challenging and then there's outright unfair and I think Lisa the Pointless treads a little too close to unfair. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of players quit playing before the end of Act 2 and that would be a shame for that to happen because the content here is absolutely incredible. For a fan made game that was created and released for non-profit, there is an absurd amount of effort put into this. I mean the game does reuse a lot of Lisa's assets, I mean obviously the environment tiles, some of the sprites and a lot of the music, but a lot of the sprites and artwork here are completely original, and they capture the feeling of Lisa remarkably well. It's really hard to tell that this isn't actually Austin's work. The battle animations display some solid production value. I love the details like how Joel's hat will even fall off if you get him to use his roll dodge move. Everything here looks and sounds the part. The new music tracks are excellent. They very much feel like something you would actually hear in Lisa. I especially love the first boss battle theme. It's just, ah, oh, it's just so good, dude. It is astounding to see so much work put into character sprites that are only on screen for a couple seconds. Though at first I thought Alex just didn't look right. It took me a moment, but I realized it's in the eyes. Brad had these really dark eyes shaded by his thick brow. It made him look pissed off and badass. Alex doesn't have those. He's just got regular eyes, and I at first thought it made the new protagonist feel non-Lisa protagonist-y, but, you know, then it hit me. This character is far, far removed from Brad and Buddy. I mean, not only is he physically far away from them, he doesn't even know them, and he's nothing like them either. I mean, Brad was directly related to the events causing the apocalypse, you know, with his connections to Buzzo and whatever. Alex, on the other hand, has nothing to do with any of that. I mean, remember the news from the title screen. No Lisa, he doesn't know her. He's just a regular person seeking a better life so of course he's gonna look this way. While Brad was very selfish, Alex is kind and thoughtful. He often puts others first, going far out of his way to aid a friend in need. Brad, on the other hand, he lets his friends get killed all the time for self-benefit. Brad gets to make decisions that hurt other people. This time, the tables are turned. With a stroke of development genius, there's a moment where an NPC makes a decision that affects you. Yeah, now how does that feel? You're the victim of a choice that was beyond your control. Like I said before, the story here is very much the opposite of Lisa the Painful. You're no longer the star of the show, but a simple survivor trying nothing more than to get away. That said, it still sports those powerful themes, which are delivered in very clever ways. As the title suggests, it deals with the argument over whether or not things are pointless. Should people put forth the effort to better their lives, even if it means risking the fact that bettering their lives may not be possible? I mean, even in the first area, you've got people who refuse to leave Garbage Island. Garbage Island! Because they don't think there's a better life for them out there. They don't think it'll get any better than Garbage Island. There's a handful of fantastic scenes where the writing really shines. My favorite is where you end up at this weird business meeting between all sorts of weird characters. There's a small man telling lies about big things. 
And this flashback sequence, oh my god. Okay, skip this part if you want to go into the game with zero spoilers. It's not like a huge one, but going into this part blind is probably the best way to experience it firsthand, but I still just really want to talk about it. Okay, so there's this one part where Alex has a flashback to his martial arts days, and you're put up against an opponent that he loses against, and that more or less destroys his martial arts career. Now, it'd be one thing just to show us this in like a cutscene, but instead, we're we're actually thrown into a real battle with Alex's opponent. We experience firsthand just how frustrating it is that none of our attacks are hitting and we don't know why. And for Christ's sake, I tried every attack on this list and none of them are working. Jesus shit. <laughs> the look of exhaustion and frustration on Alex's face. You feel it too. And then you're given another option. An illegal move, a kick to the groin. Oh, it's tempting. I just want to play dirty. I want to see this jerk go down, even if I might get banned from the tournament. I might not, though. Oh, man, should I do it? I'm probably, I'm totally going to lose if I don't. Turning this devastating moment for Alex into an actually playable boss fight where the stupid decisions Alex could potentially make are handed off to the player without even telling them. So the player can be the one to potentially make that stupid decision out of the exact same frustration Alex too is feeling. That's some good shit. I felt the frustration. I felt the temptation. I felt the rage when I lost. This whole scene is just... Man! The game is just so smart with its writing and the integration of that writing directly into the gameplay. It makes moments like these very powerful. Oh my god, dude, this game's a gold mine. I mean, like, there's some bullshit in the way, obviously, that needs fixing, but it's a gold mine nonetheless. And the best part is, this game was humbly thrown up on Game Jolt under the title of Demo. Demo. Dude, this ain't no demo. This is like a five hour game. It's like a full game. No, dude. This is only one third of the planned final product. There's warnings that there might be some bugs, and yeah, I found some bugs, but like, holy dang, dude, this project has some incredible potential. The difficulty needs better balancing for sure, but you know, that's the point of releasing builds like this, to get the feedback you need so you can improve things. And we'll all be damned, the day I'm finishing up this video, he goes and releases an update that actually fixes a lot of stuff regarding the difficulty that I criticized. Way to be on the ball, dude, like Austin was just like this when he first released Lisa the Joyful, and he probably problems or bugs people were finding, he was patching them up as fast as he could. Despite this being just a fan game for free, he's already listening to criticism and making improvements. That is some admirable dedication, dude. I still can't believe this is a fan game. The level of quality here is freaking unreal. When things like this exist, it really demonstrates just how passionate and fruitful a community can be. But like, for real, man, like, ring up Austin and make this fan game official. If there's plans on expanding Lisa the Pointless even further, Further, it almost seems unfair that it's being given away for free. I think everybody should let Austin know this game is a thing. I think things could work out very well having this guy officially develop the next chapter in the Lisa series under the supervision of Austin as he works on his new game. The current build is up on GameJolt.com. As always, there's a link to download it down in the description below. Uh, definitely check it out. It's really good, save for some of the difficulty stuff, but supposedly the newest patch fixes a lot of that, so the game now might not be nearly as hard as I made it out to be in this video, but yeah, definitely check it out. Um, here's hoping it only gets better from here. I think with the right collaboration and the right kind of support, we very well could be looking at the third official chapter in the Lisa series.